Hello everybody and welcome back to the YouTube channel. This is the first video I've filmed in a very long time and I do apologise for that, but I do have my reasons. Uh, the biggest one's fairly obvious, judging by the title of today's video. But um, if you aren't caught up to speed with things, then I'll just give a brief update. So Ratting Road is no longer a thing. I took that layout down uh, earlier on in the year and I've since been building up a new layout to take its place. This was certainly unplanned and out of the blue. But um, in all honesty, the old layout was starting to give me a bit of trouble and I just got a bit fed up with it, fell out of love with it a very long time ago. So um, in the end, I just felt like I needed to start again. So I took it down, entered negotiations to build a new layout, and here I am today. So as things stand now, all the new baseboards are built and I've spent the last couple of weeks or so just fine tuning everything, uh, making sure I'm absolutely happy before I move on and show you guys what I've been doing. So the new layout will be called Belstead Lane, and that is somewhat of a nod to where it will be based, but I won't be putting any spoilers out just yet. The new layout will be on a completely different level in terms of realism. I will be up in my game a lot with it. Um, I'll also be changing the area slightly, so I'll be taking it back another 10 years. But as the video goes on, I will be showing all the information about it and all the plans for it, so I won't give away too much. I hope you enjoy this video. So um, without further ado, I will introduce you to Belstead Lane. So I'll kick the video off just by uh, showing a 360 view of the layout. So um, this new layout runs around the entire perimeter of the shed. So I'll just keep slowly panning round. So there's different baseboards going on here, but um, I'll obviously talk more about those in a second. So as you just saw, the new layout runs around the entire room or the entire perimeter of the shed which was a condition I proposed because the old layout was far too small for what I wanted to be doing. So the new layout is 19 foot long and 12 foot wide. So um, that wall across the end there where that window is, that is roughly 12 foot wide. And then along the length of the shed, this way is about 19 foot. The old layout was 10 foot by eight foot. So um, this new layout is pretty much double the size. I built all the baseboards using 12 millimeter plywood just so it's nice and strong and also lightweight. And then the legs for the lau are all CLS timber, which you can get from places like B&Q or Wix. And then on some baseboards, I've also added some self-adhesive rubber pads just to stop them from moving. These baseboards in particular are extremely lightweight with how they've um, been designed and built. So um, as a result, they did tend to move and slide about a lot on the laminate floor. But with those rubber pads, I can give it a bit of a, a bit of a yank or whatever, and it's not going to go anywhere. So um, that sorted that problem out. All the baseboards have been built using the open frame technique. I've seen this method on quite a few layouts, so I thought I'd try it myself. What I wanted to do scenic-wise really would have benefited from having these kind of baseboards built rather than just have a traditional flat board like these other ones. So um, all these open frame boards are the scenic section boards and they make up pretty much half of the layout. So uh, there's the other one there, just behind me. And then the rest of these taller boards, which have a top on them, are the fuller yard boards. So these are the fuller yard boards, and these are about six inches taller off the ground than the scenic boards. And um, obviously the track will be raised on a scenic section to meet the same level as the fuller yard. The fuller yard runs along the entire length of the shed, so it crosses the door via a slide out section and then all the way to the other side. So as well as the 19 foot long length, I've got a little bit extra on the, on the corners as well. So I've got plenty of storage now. The old layout didn't have any storage at all. So I was constantly having to take trains on and off whenever I wanted to run something. So uh, I finally got some decent storage, which is a massive upgrade for this new layout. All of the baseboards have been built to be as modular as possible. So should I ever need to move the layout around a bit, or move it to a new location, I can without too much problem. The layout is also made up of 14 baseboards in total. So there's five baseboards which run along each length of the shed, and then there's two baseboards which run along the width of the shed. So um, you've got a pair of baseboards in the corner over there, and then you've got another pair in this corner. Both of these pairs are four foot long and two foot wide and then they're joined together in the middle by a three foot long and two foot wide section. So this means that the baseboards which run across the length of the shed are two foot wide 
and the same goes for the field yard as well. There was a reason for this. I had to allow enough room so this pool table could reside in the middle and still be used. So um, as a result, I was limited in terms of space for width for the baseboards. The baseboards which run across the width of the shed, so these ones, I didn't really have this problem, so I was able to get them three foot wide. So these two baseboards there and that foot yard board there, they're four foot long and three foot wide. And again, same applies over on the other side of the room. So pretty much everything is a mirror of each other to keep it nice and simple. Final piece of the puzzle was this slide out section baseboard. This baseboard required the most amount of thought and gave me the most amount of headaches because I wanted to come up with the best possible solution. The shed door does open inwards rather than outwards, so that always was going to create a problem. And I also wanted to keep stock on this board if possible because this is the field yard board. So if you can imagine loads of tracks running across there at some point, um, there'll be about two or three wagons on each line. And uh, I didn't really want to take stock on and off every time I needed to move it. So in the end, I did settle for a slide out section. There is a couple of sliding bolt racks on either side. So those, those are currently in place. Once this is all in place, it is nice and solid. So it doesn't move at all. There's no lateral movement there. To remove it, it's just a matter of undoing the sliding bolt racks and then it just simply pulls out. So if those now removed, it just slides out nice and easily like so. So now that shed door can actually open enough for me personally to crawl out under there. So with this setup, I do need to duck under it still, but I am used to doing that. I am young and slim, so I'm not quite getting any back problems yet. I know this area of baseboards and model railways is quite fundamental. So people do tend to have their disagreements and agreements on what's best. But at the end of the day, this was the best solution for me for all my needs. So that just slides back into place like so, and then just a matter of adding the sliding bolt racks back in. So it's quick to set up, and like I said earlier, with this setup, I should be able to have the stock remaining on the board whenever I need to move it. It does extend out fully and is also fully removable. The rollers do have some levers on them to be able to remove the board completely and extend it outwards. Um, so this method did tick all my boxes and all my needs, so I am very happy with the result. So um, that's pretty much all the baseboards covered now. So I'm going to now move on to the next stage of the video, which is talking about all the new setting. Belsford Lane, like the previous layout, will be set on the Great Eastern Main Line, and I will be focusing on the Ipswich area again. This area is quite local to me, and there's a lot of traffic in this area and quite a lot going on. However, this time round, I will be taking a lot of inspiration from Belsford Bank, hence why I took the decision to name the layout after it. Belsford Bank is located just a few miles south of Ipswich, so it is still part of the area and it's a very popular location for photography and train spotting. I quite like the scenery on Belsford Bank. There's a lot of different um, scenes going on. Um, there's different levels of terrain as well. So you've got a lot of cuttings and a lot of hillsides. Um, flat fields which run next to the railway etc. So one of the reasons why I built the open frame baseboards was so I can capture the different levels of scenery so the track can run above the scenery and it's also easy to model the cutting as well. So Belsford Lane will mostly be a two track running main line just to keep it with the Great Eastern Main Line theme and um, run around some nicely modelled countryside. There are some other elements I want to bring back from the previous layout such as the Ipswich Tunnel um, this will act as one of the scenic breaks, but this time round, I will be trying to make it even more accurate. I do have plans to either scratch build or laser cut a complete replica of the real Ipswich tunnel just to help create that image. The tunnel will be the correct way round this time, so I will be modelling a long sweeping curve leading up to the tunnel entrance, just like the real thing. I also want to try and build some sort of depot like I did previously, and um, I do have an idea to try and copy the track work of the real life Ipswich Freightliner Depot. But this is one of those things that will only really work if I have enough room for it. The fact the baseboards are two foot wide does mean I will be quite limited for space. I do have potential to build some extension boards to give me some extra room. But again, it's just not really set in stone yet. 
so it depends really how I get on. I want this layout to be as simple as possible in terms of operation and I also want it to be as realistic as possible. So I'll be trying my best to avoid typical model railway characteristics like too much track work so everything looks contrived and unnatural. Um, obviously the scenery will be as natural as possible so I will be having the track above the scenery, below the scenery rather than just have everything on the same level. A lot of model railways will have their scenery built as if the scenery is made to go around the railway, whereas I want mine to look as if the railway was built on top of the scenery, just like it is in real life. So how will all this fit on the layout? Well, these are the full yard boards, so all the storage for the trains will be here. So on these corner boards, all the point work will begin, and then they'll go around the bends, go down the, all the straights there, and then another set of bends and the points on the other side of the layout. So that's how the um, full yard will function. Pretty standard, really. So then the scenic section will begin here. So the track will be raised. Um, there'll be a bridge of some sort here for a scenic break. Pretty standard again. But then from here, there will be a very long sweeping curve. And I want it to be as gentle as possible just to come around this bend. I will most likely add some corner extension pieces there because I will have some extra room to be able to do that. And then it will run down the length of the baseboards. Um, I will try and make the track work as realistic as possible. So it will come down here and then over in this corner is where I hope to build the depot. So um, all that part of the layout over there will just be strictly two track mainline running through countryside scenery. Um, so it will go on for quite a long run. But over here is where I hope to have a bit more of the um, sort of the play value of the layout, if you like. So I will hopefully be able to build some sort of depot in this area. Um, this is also where the Ipswich Tunnel Portal will go. So the track work will be um, going to the left from this camera angle. So it will follow the correct track alignment in real life. Because of this window, the, the scenic section will probably start just after the window frames there. If you look at where the filter yard is, it's almost the same height as the window frame. So um, I was quite limited to what I could do here. But if the scenic section starts after the window frames there, then um, what I'm hoping to also have is have my workbench here. So if I have some sort of flat board on this remaining piece of baseboard here and then have a chair or something, so that at least I've got some sort of workspace in here. Then obviously from here is where it will go back into the field yard and then meet with all the rest of the trains. So most of you are probably thinking right now that the idea I've got for the layout is rather basic, but um, I did want to keep it simple. I want to try and build this layout relatively quickly so I can at least enjoy it. I never actually finished the previous layout, so uh, I hope this layout will be a different story. There's plenty of ideas in my head to capture realism, so I will be using Code 75 track, and um, I will also be going down the route of spacing out the sleepers potentially. So um, uh, there's some exercises there. I do want to try to make this layout as realistic as possible. Um, I will be modeling overhead catenary again of the same design as last time. However, all the masts and things will be completely uh, built from scratch this time. So um, everything on this layout will be pretty fresh and new. So that's all the future plans I have for the layout and what I hope to achieve in the future. I appreciate it's not everyone's cup of tea and some might not like it or find it boring. But at the end of the day, it's what I want to do and it is my layout. The only thing left to talk about now, and I've left it until last, is the change of era. This is the more interesting part of the new layout and what I will be focusing on heavily. I will be backdating it about 10 years when compared to the previous one to focus on what is arguably the best and most interesting period on the Great Eastern Main Line and is also my favourite period of them all. Elstead Lane will be another Great Eastern Mainline double O gauge layout which focuses on the National Express takeover from Anglia Railways and this dates from 2004 to 2007. Anglia Railways was launched in January 1997 after its parent company GB Railways was awarded the Intercity Anglia franchise. 
Anglia Railways would inherit the previous British rail fleet, which consisted of Class 86 electric locomotives and Mark II F coaching stock and DBSOs. These would operate between London Liverpool Street and Norwich into city services, as well as London Liverpool Street and Harwich International boat train services. Also amongst the inherited fleet were Class 150 and Class 153 DMUs. These would operate the more regional services previously operated by regional railways. The Anglia Railways turquoise and white livery was unveiled in June 1998 and would go on to be applied to the whole fleet. The fleet of Mark II coaches would also go on to receive a new refurbishment and overhaul. In 1999, the first batch of Class 170 turbo star units were introduced into service. These new free car units would operate a new introduced service which ran between London Liverpool Street and Sheringham, Great Yarmouth and Lowestoft. In May 2000, a new London Crosslink service was introduced, which ran between Norwich and Basingstoke. The Class 170s would operate this service, but due to poor loadings, the service ceased in 2002. In 2002, a new batch of two car Class 170 units was delivered, and these operated a newly introduced service, which ran between Norwich and Cambridge. 2002 also saw the introduction of Class 90s being used on passenger trains on the Great Eastern Main Line. Freightliner would hire in a single Class 90 electric locomotive to Anglia Railways. This was done to trial as replacements for the aging Class 86s. EWS would go on to hire in three of their Class 90s to Anglia Railways in 2003. After nearly seven years of service, Anglia Railways would go on to lose the franchise in December 2003. National Express was awarded the franchise and would go on to launch the new One franchise in April 2004. Back in 2001, the Strategic Rail Authority announced plans to combine all services that operated out of London Liverpool Street into one big franchise. This new franchise would be called the Greater Anglia Franchise and was a combination of the East Anglia, Great Eastern and West Anglia, Great Northern franchises. National Express were the first to operate this new franchise and launch the One franchise in April 2004. The new franchise's name was a reflection of the union of the three smaller franchises now being combined into one bigger franchise. One inherited the fleet of all three previous franchises. This included the old Anglia Railways Class 86s, Mark IIs and DMUs. One also inherited the fleet of electric multiple units from West Anglia Great Northern and First Great Eastern. Amongst the EMU fleet were Class 315s, 317s and 321s. The newer Class 360 units were also part of the inherited fleet. These new units were much more modern in design and had only been introduced in the previous year. A franchise commitment was to replace the ageing Anglia Class 86 and Mark II coaches with newer Class 90s and Mark III coaches and DVTs. These would get transferred over from Virgin Trains on the West Coast Main Line after their fleet of Class 90s and Mark III coaches were replaced by Class 390 Pendolinos. Despite being in a very run-down condition, the Virgin stock entered service straight away. The Mark III coaches and DVTs would lose the Virgin branding, whilst the Class 90s would lose the Virgin stripes as well as the branding and just wore the bare red and black livery. On the 1st of April 2004, along with the launch of the One franchise, Class 903, along with a full rake of Mark III's, were presented at London Liverpool Street to reveal the new One livery. The new livery consisted of a dark blue metallic base paint along with some colourful stripes which were placed along the cab side windows and doors. The new liveried colourful train would go on to work the 12.30 London Liverpool Street to Norwich service. This livery would go on to be applied to a handful of stock before the dark blue metallic was replaced by a lighter shade of blue. 
The rest of the fleet will go on to receive the one livery in a lighter shade of blue. The Mark III stock will also be treated to an overhaul and refurbishment. With the newer Class 90s and Mark III's being refurbished and receiving their new liveries, the Class 86 and Mark II's from Anglia will still be used in service. The last of the Class 86's weren't withdrawn until 2005, whilst the Mark II coaches were still around until 2006. As a result, it wasn't uncommon to see the two generations of coaches being mixed together. You also had the mix of refurbished and unrefurbished sets running together as well, which created a lot of variety. EWS Class 90s were still hired in to cover for any potential unavailability of one's own fleet of Class 90s. In 2005, a small fleet of Class 156s was received from Central Trains in exchange for their fleet of Class 150s. This marked the units return to their original home turf, having been transferred away from the region in the early 90s. Class 47 diesel locomotives were hired in from Cotswold Rail to act as Thunderbird rescue locomotives. They also operated special summer Saturday services which ran between Norwich and Great Yarmouth. This involved dragging the Class 90 Mark III sets after they had terminated from London. By 2007 most of the one fleet would have been refurbished or received a new livery. There wasn't much that wasn't carrying the livery at this point. The one livery was very short-lived, having only lasted till 2008 when National Express decided to rebrand the franchise as National Express East Anglia. The entire fleet would lose the one branding and would go on to receive National Express branding. Some members of the fleet were fortunate enough to receive an all-new white and grey livery. National Express would continue operating the franchise up until October 2011 when it was awarded to Abellio. Abellio would take over all the services operated by National Express in February 2012, commencing the new Greater Anglia franchise. Abellio have held the franchise ever since and continue to operate it today after 11 years of service. Their current rail contract is scheduled to run out in 2026. Belstead Lane will be set during the 2004 to 2007 era, which marks the end of Anglia Railways along with the full takeover of National Express. And then it just runs up to just before they rebranded. So all of what you just saw is what you can expect to see on the new layout. I chose this era because I've always been interested in it and I do wish I modelled it from the very beginning. The sheer variety just in the passenger workings makes it a very interesting era in my opinion, hence why I chose it. There's also plenty of variety in the freight as well. So um, with the Great Eastern Main Line, the vast majority of freight traffic is container traffic. So uh, my layout will still be heavily focused on the container or intermodal services on the Great Eastern Main Line. With Freightliner, the Class 47s and 57s were still in operation, but they were in their final years. Freightliner's fleet of Class 47s were becoming increasingly unreliable. So as a result, these would get replaced by the newer Class 66s. Freightliner withdrew their small fleet of Class 57s in 2007 and these got transferred over to different train operating companies. The Class 66 quickly became the standard UK freight locomotive and operated the vast majority of freight trains across the network. GB Rail Freight and EWS also operated Class 66s on a variety of freight trains in this region. They were also often seen on the Felix Stowe container workings. Class 86 and Class 90 electric locomotives were also frequently seen working these Felix Stowe container services. These locomotives either carried a Freightliner racing green livery or the classic Freightliner triple grey livery. 
The triple grey livery, which is a personal favourite of mine, was still quite commonly seen in this era, which is another reason why I wanted to model it. It won't just be the container trains I'll be modelling, I will be modelling pretty much anything that ran in this region, which includes the Harris to North Walsham TAA tanker train, as well as other trains like the aggregates trains, which served all the various terminals around East Anglia. EWS operated a containerised steel service, which ran between Scumthorpe and Felixstowe. Direct rail services operated the railhead treatment train, as well as the nuclear flask services, which ran between Wilston and Sizewell. And then lastly, the engineers trains, which carried ballast, scrap rail, new rail and sleepers and all the rest of it all over the region. And then there was also the fuel delivery trains, utilising a short rake of tankers, which served the Ipswich Freightliner depot. So all in all, there's a hell of a lot of variety going on in this region, both in passenger workings and freight. So that's the reason why I decided to take it all back 10 years. And all of what I've just shown you is what you can all expect to see running on Belstead Lane in the future. Late service to Norwich. So that's all of what you can expect from Belstead Lane in the future and I will be trying my hardest to keep up to date with the YouTube this time. Um, I know I've been very inconsistent over the past couple of years but that was mainly down to just having no motivation with the old lout so it just wasn't really worth making any films or anything but um, that will now change and so I will be trying my hardest to keep up to date with YouTube. I am changing the YouTube channel's name to suit the new lout. I have already changed the other social medias and started a new RM web page. I've left all those links to my other social medias in the description below. But yeah, just thought I'd give a heads up that Belstead Lane will be becoming the new YouTube channel's name. So the next video will be uploaded under Belstead Lane, just to save any confusion. I won't be getting rid of any old Ratting Road content. I will just be putting it into an archive folder just to keep it separate from the new Louts content. So then it's all kept simple. I hope you enjoyed this video and uh, I'll see you again soon. Take care, guys, and happy modelling.